So good afternoon. It is a great joy. Afternoon. Afternoon. I'm going to have to get used to saying <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, it's a great joy to be able to gather with you and open up the Bible with you. If I haven't gotten to meet you, my name is Aaron, uh, and I'm one of the pastors here at The Trails. And this afternoon, we're going to be starting uh, a new series uh, called Not By Sight. And in this uh, series, um, the kind of the, the byline, the tagline of it is Walking By Faith in Uncertain Times. And when we kind of planned this, uh, we had no idea the uncertainty of the times of which we would now be walking. Uh, this is always kind of God's providence and his design of, of putting this on our hearts, oh, uh, two, three months ago, and then us kind of beginning to, to process and pray through it. And then here we are, uh, in even more uncertain times. And I feel like life kind of unrolls and unravels that way, right? No, no matter where we're at in life, there's always sort of uncertainty, but this is sort of a... A different level of uncertainty, kind of for for everyone, right? Like we've always known there's a vague sense of uncertainty, no matter what in life. Like the older that I I'm getting, when I when I was younger, I thought everything there was a lot of certainty in everything. My parents knew everything, my grandparents knew everything. Everyone was certain of a lot of things. And the older that I got, the more I realized even they were just faking it uh, or something, because because there's zero certainty actually in this life. And I, I don't know if you just get better at, at faking it, better at living in the midst of it, better at trusting in God's providence and, and his faithfulness in and through it. But but here we are, uh, kind of all of us now walking through that. Some of us maybe before we were ready to start learning some of these lessons. And some of us, as we're a bit further down the line, saying, yeah, here's just another thing that we're going to walk through. And we're going to trust in God's faithfulness in the midst of it. And so one of the things that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks is as we're here as Christians living in this time and in this season, how are we being called by God to be people of faith here and now, right? In the midst of our, uh, in the midst of our city, in the midst of Winnipeg, in the midst of a culture like this. And I want to ask right here at the beginning of our time together, firstly, what is faith? What is faith? I mean, we're having this study and we're talking about faith. If, if Christians are those who are people of faith, that it's by faith that we are saved, then what does it mean? What does faith even mean? If someone were to ask you tomorrow uh, morning, either during a, a work break or at lunch, and they came up to you and said, hey, I know that you are kind of like going to a church or, or maybe you're a Christian. Well, what, is it, what is faith? Well, what does it mean to have faith in a season like this? And we might not know how to answer right away. We might be like, uh, faith is, and we might, we might begin to kind of string together a couple of Bible scriptures that we have memorized or known throughout the years and, and kind of sort of fumble through an answer of, uh, this is kind of what faith is. And so what we're going to do today is try to talk about what is faith and why is it important for us as God's people. And so before we do that, though, I want to know where would you go to try to answer this question I thought of three different places. I thought, one, you could go to social media. That's where you find a lot of information. Uh, go to social media and try to answer this question. We might hear that, that faith is emotional. It's convictional. It's sort of this blind leap that you just take. right? Like, if I was just going to jump off somewhere, right? like you can jump off by faith, trusting and believing maybe that things are going to work out. Like, if any of you remember seeing Indiana Jones, he gets to this place where he has to have the leap of faith. Remember, and he steps down, and whoa, the bridge is there. And then you, the, the camera angle moves, and you're like, he was there all along. He just needed to have a leap of faith. Uh, if not, you can go home and watch this movie. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but it's a great movie. Uh, that's, that's one answer. It's, it's an emotional, a blind leap of faith. We just jump out. We, it's into the unknown. Uh, no. Right? Like, that's where it goes. Another option in our city, one that we talked about during the Half Truth series, it's, it's common to hear that faith is the power by which we move the hand of God. If we have enough of it, we can do anything. So it's a, a power that we possess, that we sort of tap into, and as we wield it, we can go from victim to victor, from sick to well, from poor to rich. It's sort of this harnessing this power or this essence. It's kind of like Star Wars, right? If you can tap into the force, then you can make things happen. You can, these are not the droids you're looking for, right? Like you can, you can bring into existence things that you want to happen, visualize it and tap into it. Other people might say that faith is, is not emotional. It's not a power that we wield, but it's rather rational. 
right? It's banking everything upon data and historical fact. It's more of a resolved agreement that everything that we know to be true can be factually presented as true. Like, for example, you have faith that Abraham Lincoln lived and that he was an American president. Why? Well, I don't know. You read about it in the book. It's a factual data point, right? So, so something that, that is purely rational, verifiable, undeniably based things. You might hear people say, well, you have faith. I have science, which is really a faith in science. Uh, but but so, so these are sort of some of the, the options that we have. So this, this blind jump, it is this power that we wield. It is just data points. And so how would, we, how would we answer this question? I don't think any of those are right, but, but how, would we, how would we answer this? And as a Christian, my aim is not to see what social media or others might say about faith, rather to examine God's word. Right? That's where we should go as God's people, to see what does God say? How does God define faith? And as we examine the Bible, we come across many scriptures that talk about faith. For example, we see that it is through faith that we are saved from facing the wrath or the just judgment of God for our many sins. This, this faith is in the person and work of Jesus, of course, that he has been faithful in our place, that he has stood condemned in our place, facing the judgment of God that we deserve to pay. So, for example, in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace, by grace, you have been saved through faith. Right? So, so for by grace, God's undeserved kindness given to you in and through the person and work of, of Jesus, not, not because you deserved it or earned it, but, but much rather because you are a divine traitor against him and an enemy of him. And yet he offers you, by grace, undeserved kindness to come to his table and, and have salvation to be saved from facing his just judgment against your many sins in and through the person and work of Jesus so that through faith in Jesus, we can be saved. All of that is by grace. And what we see is that, that all of this, this, and this is not your own doing. This by grace, being saved through faith, is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's not something that we earn as we stand before God. So faith comes as a gift of God, not a result of works, okay? Okay. So it's not a power that we muster up. It's a gracious gift of God. And we also see through God's word that faith is produced in our hearts as we hear the word of God, the Bible, as it is taught, as we read it, as the God's word is exposed to us, as we hear it preached and read and we get into it, God uses his word and it doesn't return void. But it's the means by which God produces faith in our hearts. Look at me in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing. That's where it comes from. And hearing just anything? No, hearing the word of God. And then we also see Hebrews 11, 1, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And, and faith is not supposed to remain private for us, but it's to work itself out into our everyday lives. We see Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. It says, the just shall live by faith. It's supposed to have these implications in our lives. Uh, we also, I don't have it on the screen, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, here we see where Christians are called to walk by faith, not by sight, which is where we got the name of this series, <laughs> right? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, walk by faith, not by sight. To walk by faith in God's promises, to trust in his word more than in what we can see and touch and feel. So in bringing together all of these things in many more scriptures and examining them, I believe that we can confidently say that faith is explained through the Bible. As one pastor says, that faith is the God-given ability. So it's the God-given, the gift ability. Gift ability is not a word, I don't think. But, uh, but it is. It's a gift ability to trust in the promises of God. The God-given ability to trust in the promises of God. So it doesn't come from us. It comes from God as a gift extended to us. Right? And this God-given ability to trust in the promises of God allows us, by grace and through faith, to trust in the promises of God, even when our eyes cannot see how things are going to work out. We can't see how everything is, 
is going to come to pass. And so for the next few weeks, we're actually going to be turning to a chapter in the Bible that is known for being a chapter that deals with faith, uh, specifically Hebrews chapter 11. So if you have a Bible or uh, a phone that uh, has access to uh, the Bible, uh, you can open with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews is a book in the New Testament. Uh, the chapters are the really big numbers. Verses are the really tiny ones. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter or big number 11. And if you've been around Christianity for any amount of time, then you might already know that this chapter sort of gives us the Coles Notes version of some of the major characters in the Bible, right? It hits some of the main storylines, which is also really good because if you are newer to the Bible, you can get a quick glance at God's faithfulness throughout the generations and how his people have always been those who have walked by faith. This is a hallmark of God's people. They are not those who, who saw his promises come to fruition in their lifetime, but rather by this God-given ability had this trust in God's promises. And they walked by faith, relying and trusting and depending on God's faithfulness to keep his word. And so today is going to be more of an overview of the book of Hebrews. And we're going to be learning uh, how chapter 11 fits in the overall context of the letter. And then next week, we're going to be diving into the letter. All right, so this week we're going to do an overview. What is the book of Hebrews? Why is it important? Where does chapter 11 fit into the argument that the book of Hebrews is making? Why is it important? That way, any time throughout your life when you come to Hebrews 11, you can say, I know why that chapter is in the Bible. Right? Because right now, if someone asked you why it was there, you'd be like, I don't know, to teach us about faith? I don't know. But I want you to have a much more solid place of knowing why is chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews? Because it's part of the argument that the author of Hebrews is making. And so I want us to know why it's there, because there is a deep well of confidence here for us as Christians, especially in walking through uncertain times. And if we don't know that it's there, we won't go to it. Right, like imagine your favorite restaurant if you didn't even know it was there, and then I introduce you to it, and you're like, I drove past this place all the time. Right? In the same way, chapter eleven will become this bedrock of confidence and hope for you. So let's pray one more time, and then we're gonna dive into this text. So Father, Father, we pray that as we walk into your word this morning, as we think and, and process through why we even have the letter of Hebrews and why chapter 11 is so vitally important, both in our lives and in the lives of these men and women in this book, we pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and minds to comprehend. We pray that we'd have hearts that are soft to your word, not hard against it. Oh God, we need you because anytime that we come to your word, we will walk away if you do not come and bless us, we will walk away with harder hearts than when we walked into it. God, we are dependent upon you for, for life and hope and rest and joy and comfort. And God, we need you. And so we, we pray, God, that you would use your word to bring confidence into our hearts today. And we ask this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so as we're getting started this morning, I want to begin by giving you a little background on the book of Hebrews so that uh, as, as we're getting started, you can know what has happened so far in the book all the way up to chapter 11 and how it fits, as I mentioned, in the overall argument of this book, the, the encouragement that, that the author has for these Hebrew Christians. It would be sort of like if I just jumped into the moment of it and said, this is what's going on, like, like you know those wonderful Hallmark movies that are coming out right now? It's like you just walk into the resolution scene and you miss all the buildup. You, you miss the Christmas tree farm, and you, you know you miss all of the all of the beauty. Uh, right before you get to the moment, you're like, oh, that was a satisfying Hallmark film, right? Like, like so. I, I wanted to I wanted to, to walk through so that we can walk through why this is uh, so helpful and encouraging for us in our lives. So, the book of Hebrews. I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, most books in the Bible were written uh, to churches. This uh, is written to a group of Hebrews. Jewish people uh, who had uh, become Christians. And uh, in the opening line of this book, uh, it says, uh, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers. That's your big hint that you know who this is to. Right? So, long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So, so this word, our fathers, gives the immediate clue that this book is written to Jewish people who, as we will see as the book unfolds, are those who have come to believe upon Jesus as the Messiah. 
They have searched the scriptures and they have come to see that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. He is the Messiah, the true king over Israel. He is their God, their God with them, fully God and fully man, who has suffered in their place, died and risen from the dead to usher in the salvation for God's people and for the world. The fulfillment of all of God's promises to his people throughout the Old Testament. And this opening line also lets us know that the author of the book is, guess what, also Jewish. Our fathers. Right, get that? Like that it does like a two, two-way thing here. It's like, our fathers, you're all Jewish, I'm also part of this with you. Other than that, though, surprisingly, we don't know a whole lot about the author of this book. There are a lot of people that would guess of, of who this guy is. But there's not a lot of things that we know about him. Uh, we see in chapter 13, verse 19, that the Hebrews that he was writing to, they knew who he was. He says in chapter 13, verse 19, he longs to be reunited with them, which meant he was with them previously, right? Uh, and then he even mentions they have a mutual friend in Timothy in chapter 13, verse 23. But other than that, we don't know who this author is. Uh, unlike a lot of the other books, the book of Hebrews remains anonymous to us. We don't get to know the name of this brother. And throughout church history, there have been many guesses as to who the author of this book is. Maybe it's Paul. Maybe it's Apollos. Maybe it's Barnabas. Maybe it is Luke. No, nobody quite knows. But we know that it was someone who's associated with the apostles. But other than that, we have to wait until a day yet to come. Lord willing, when we get to heaven, we're like, Jesus, who wrote Hebrews? And he's like, this guy. And you're like, oh, that makes sense. Right? But until that day, we don't know. We don't know. But when was this letter written? That we don't really know either. Well, we know it was any. It was sometime between A.D. 33 and A.D. 70. We know that because uh, this book talks about the sacrificial system of Judaism. Remember where they, they made sacrifices according to God's word in the Old Testament? And it doesn't say that that has ceased from happening. But, but rather, the indication is it's ongoing. And so we know it's sometime in there. And we know it's a guy who loved Jesus. And we know that they knew who he was. Other than that, we don't know. And this book can be divided into two really big, broad sections. Uh, the first section uh, is one that is uh, from 1-1 till 10-18. And what this section shows us is that Jesus is greater or better than any angel or priest or institution. And this is important because many of the early Jews at this time were tempted to return back to Judaism. The cost of following Jesus was very high at this time. And there was this pull to return back to a religious system of their upbringing. And so this letter is going to argue over and over and over again to remind these Hebrew Christians that Jesus is the fulfillment of these systems. He is the greater. He is the better. And they need to be reminded of that. They are not people who need priests any longer to bring daily sacrifices for them. For they have the king, the priest, who's made the ultimate sacrifice of his own life. And now, after that sacrifice, he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And Jesus is greater than the Mosaic law. He is the fulfillment of it. And that law cannot make them righteous. Though they kept being tempted to believe, oh, but maybe it can. And so the writer says, no, 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 it can't. Don't go back there. There is no hope in life there. Jesus has already fulfilled it. Trust in Jesus. And so over and over again, this is his plea in writing over and over again. He is greater or better than these angels and these priests and these institutions. And so that's the first section, over and over again. And then the second section is a call to faithfulness and endurance for these believers. This is uh, chapter 10, verse 19, until really the very end of the book. And why do these Hebrew Christians need to have endurance? Why do they need to be called to remember to have faith and to endure? Why do they need to be reminded in chapter 11 specifically of God's faithfulness to his people throughout the generations? And that's what we're going to look into in a moment. And well, let's go ahead and do that. All right, so who are these Hebrews? Well, firstly... Firstly, we see that these guys are Christians. We've talked about that already, but that's an important thing to say. These are people who've come to believe upon Jesus. They have faith in him. They have this God-given ability to trust in all of the promises of God. They have been met and fulfilled in 
Jesus. They have left behind the sacrificial system of Judaism and have recognized that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises of God. So now, by faith, as Hebrews, if you want to look in your Bibles, as Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 explains, they now have confidence to enter the holy places, to come into the very presence of God. Which, if you don't know anything about Judaism, that is a big deal for a Jew. Uh, so the presence of God, remember in, in Old Testament times, there was the Holy of Holies. There was this big uh, uh, thing like that. What's that called? Curtain. Thank you. Uh, I'm like, I know what that is in English. Uh, a big curtain around the Holy of Holies. And one time, of, one time a year, the high priest would go in. He would have bells on the bottom of his clothing and a rope tied around him so that just in case he walked in and had any sin that was unconfessed and unatoned for, when he entered into the presence of God, if he had any sin, he would drop down dead immediately. They would hear the jingling of the bells and no one would go in after him. They'd pull a rope and pull him out because they would not dare go in to the presence of God lest they also die because they realize how stained and dirty we are as humans. And they realize how holy and righteous and perfect God is. So only one time a year would the priests go into the Holy of Holies and make these sacrifices. And so for these brothers and sisters to have confidence before God, to enter into the holy places of God, is astounding. But they don't, they don't come in on their own ability. You know what we see in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, is they have confidence to enter in the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for them through the curtain that is his flesh. In, his, in their place, he stood condemned. And so they can now, not with fear, but with great certainty, enter into the very presence of God. And this would have been astounding for them. Your whole life being told you can never enter into the holy places of God and expect anything but to face judgment. And yet now, God has provided a way for them who are dirty and deserve God's judgment to be forgiven and welcomed in. And not only welcomed in, but to walk in with confidence. Right? Not with fear, not with trembling, not with anxiety, but Confidently, they can come before God the Father with great joy, not on what they have done, but because of the blood of Jesus spilled out in their place. And what we see in chapter 10, as, we, as chapter 10 unfolds, we see in verses 22 to 25 that these men and women have drawn near to God. Not only can they, but they have. They have drawn near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith. And they've had their hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. They have been made holy by the blood of Jesus. And their bodies have been washed in pure water. They are clean. As a result of this faith in Jesus, they can hold fast their confession. And they can do so without wavering, trusting in the faithfulness of God. And they can gather together with other believers. This is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us as Christians is one another. That we are God's great gifts to one another. That we might encourage one another. And to provoke one another. To stir one another. Think about like a fire in winter that's starting to die out. And you stoke it. And then it's back again. That is what God has created us to do in one another's hearts and lives as God's people. To stoke fires of affection and love and remembrance of what Jesus has done with us. To, for us to remember that we can draw near with great confidence not about what we have done, but because of what Christ has done. That we can hold fast to our confession without wavering because he who promises is faithful. Not because we are. And we're called to encourage one another in this and provoke one another in love and good works. We see in verse 24-25. And by so doing, they show their love for God by how they love one another. And they're anticipating and they're awaiting the day when Jesus will come and set up his kingdom here on the earth. That's what you see at the end of verse 25. It says, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this is what they give themselves to as God's people, drawing near, holding fast, and encouraging one another. And as they wait, what we see in the next uh, section, verses 26 to 31, as they wait, their lives are to be growing in holiness. They are not to be those who deliberately sin. 
They're not to be those who have deliberate, ongoing sin in their lives. No, because they have been transformed by Jesus. And they've been given faith to believe in the promises of God. And they are walking out their faith by God's sustaining and persevering grace. And we see that starting in verse 32. See, the writer of Hebrews, he reminds them of how they have participated in the sufferings of Christ. They're not amateurs. They're not, they have not just begun following Jesus. They are those who have walked with Jesus. They are not those who, when they heard the message of Jesus, received it immediately with joy, only to fall away when times of persecution came on account of the word. No, they were those who, they heard it with joy, and when times of persecution came, their faith shone like the morning sun, as being true, as being the outworking of God's grace in and through their lives. See, they are those who have remained faithful during persecution. Let's, let's read these verses together. It says, but recall the former days. He's reminding them. He's recalling to their minds. He, he knows these, these men and women. He knows what they've walked through. He says, recall the former days. After you were enlightened, after the light of Christ enlightened you, right? You went from darkness into light. You endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. Sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. See, these brothers and sisters, they knew what it was to endure sufferings on account of the word. They knew that following Christ cost a lot. But the author of Hebrews also knows that although they have endured these things, they are still in need of further endurance. So he writes them in verse 35. He says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence. If you remember that word confidence, we, we saw it in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. The confidence that we have to approach the throne of God's grace into his holy places. Don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw it away. So he assures them, verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So he's encouraged them. He's saying, keep your eye on the promise. He will not leave you or forsake you. He's going to prepare a place for you. In this world, you will have troubles, but take heart. Take heart. I've overcome the world. And we have been given his spirit and his power to do the same. And so to encourage them to remain faithful to Jesus and to endure, the author then quotes the prophet Habakkuk. That's, that, that's what, if, if in your Bible, mine has like a little special little section. And it has like these verses, get a little wild, the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. He shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That, that comes from the prophet Habakkuk. And he quotes this to remind these Jewish Christians that their faith rests in the knowledge that Jesus is coming soon. It's coming soon. The day is coming when their faith will be made sight. And so to provoke them to love and to good works as they have done with one another, he reminds them of the bedrock of their hope, which is found here. And he calls them to not shrink back. He calls them to look forward to a future day. Right? In the midst of their suffering, he says, be faithful. Don't remember your confidence. Look forward. There's a day coming where Jesus is coming. Look forward to that. Don't fix it here on what you're walking through now. Look forward. Have this, this idea of this future glory, this future presence of God here on the earth when all things that are sad will become untrue. Look forward to that day. And to not shrink back. And then I can imagine verse verse. Uh, 39, kind of with a little smile on his face, he writes and he says, And we are not those, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. See, the call for these Hebrews is to remember their confidence before God, not to lose it, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of immense loss, even in the midst of state sponsored thievery of their private property, even in the midst of being thrown into jail. Don't lose your confidence before God. Once 
remember, they had no confidence before God. But now by Jesus, they now have confidence with God. Still throw it away. Why is your confidence in the things of this earth which are passing away? Don't find your confidence there. Remember your true confidence. Hold on to that in the midst of whatever you're walking through. See, they have this promise of God. Jesus is coming. All sad things are coming to an end. There's a day coming. There will be no more sickness, no more cancer, no more pandemics, no more any of this. It's coming. It's coming. So walk by faith, not by sight. So he encourages these Christians that are walking through immense suffering to remind them of the day where Jesus would return. But then starting in chapter 11, in chapter 11, we see a turn in his argument. And he encourages them not to look forward, but to look backwards. To look backwards. To examine and remember the faithfulness of God throughout the generations of people who have come before. To recount the many ways that God has led his people throughout the ages. And if you look at chapter 11, if you see how many verses there are, there are 40 of them. And in those 40 verses, we have, as mentioned, a Coles Notes version of the entire Old Testament. And the author repeats this refrain, that just like them, the people in the Old Testament were given the ability to hold on to God's promises at a great cost to themselves. Through persecution and loss, through danger and sword, because they had their eye on the future promises of God. And even here, in chapter 11, they had their eye on the past faithfulness of God. And this is what allowed them to be sustained in the middle as they're waiting to see how God would provide for them. See, they can trust in the promises of God even when their eyes can't see it by looking forward and looking backward and remembering everyone who came before and what is yet to come. And it's interesting to note as Hebrews 11 unfolds that we aren't given any sort of rose-colored expectation that everything is going to get better for these Hebrew Christians. We're not given that. As we examine the contents of Hebrews 11, what's, what's striking here is that there is no comfort that is given to them that assures that God's blessing is just right around the corner. Just, that's coming. Life is about to get a lot better. No, there is no hope, actually, that things are going to get better on the earth. See, when people are suffering around us, we, we like to tell them things are going to get better, don't we? Yeah. We love that. We're like, oh, don't worry. Everything's going to get better. We don't know that. How do we know that? We don't know that. And the author of Hebrews, he has this opportunity of saying, oh, it's okay. Things are going to get better. Like right now, in the midst of a pandemic, don't worry, things are going to get better. Are they? Are they? I don't know. You don't know? Nobody knows. We don't know. That's not a great place of encouragement that, oh, don't worry, things on the earth are going to get better for you. No, actually, if we read the book, what we see is things get worse for us the further that we get closer to the coming kingdom of Jesus. They get a lot worse. Right? Our brothers and sisters around the world right now that are suffering and dying as martyrs for the gospel of Jesus, they would attest to that fact. Life gets harder. See, and so, so I love this because the author of Hebrews doesn't give them a rose-colored picture of the future. He's not like, don't worry, it's going to get better. No, he, he encourages them of God's faithfulness in the past to strengthen them to endure the sufferings that they're about to walk through. And this is why Hebrews 11 is such a, a beautiful reminder to us because that's what we see happening in it. And, and I love this because the author of, of Hebrews, he actually does the opposite of what we would do. Right? He doesn't present this long list of people and explain how they got everything that God promised them in the middle of their lifetime. No, he does the opposite. Look at me at verse 13. He says, all of these guys, all of them died in faith, not having received the things promised, <laughs> but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And while at first blush, that might not sound that encouraging, right? Like you wouldn't want to open up a, a greeting card tomorrow and read that like, oh, that's not very encouraging. Right? Like Hallmark isn't going to sell that card anytime soon. You're not going to see it on a coffee cup. Uh, but, but we are never promised that things are going to get better on the earth, but rather we see that things are going to get worse. But there is a better hope in the midst of walking by faith and not by sight, one that is unshakable. And so Hebrews 11 encourages these suffering saints that the suffering that they are walking through is nothing new. 
The people of God have always been those who had to walk by faith and not by sight. And yet the beautiful thing these Hebrews Christians could see is that God was faithful to all of his promises in, in Hebrews 11. Think about that. If you got this letter, or if you've read it yourself, you read Hebrews 11, and you're like, man, yeah, God was faithful to all those people. We're living and we're seeing the faithfulness of God as we look back throughout the, the history of, of God's people. They could look and see, oh yeah, all of God's promises came true in Jesus. That one, and that one, and that one, and that one. They could do that. They could see that God was faithful throughout history. How the Messiah had come, how the suffering servants stood condemned in their place and won their salvation. Everything that these men and women in Hebrews 11 believed by faith, these Hebrew Christians who were first receiving this letter, they had seen with their own eyes. Everything that the people in Hebrews 11 anticipated and longed for and desired and greeted from afar and believed by faith, these in the book of Hebrews had seen and experienced and believed. But now what is happening is it's time for these Hebrew Christians to wait as well and to join in the waiting of God's people. Walking by faith and not by sight and casting their great hope to a true and a better country. They're called to have the faith of Abraham, trusting the promise of the Son and awaiting the day of God's kingdom. And that's what we see beginning to happen in the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12. If you look at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God the Father. So, so having seen the history of God's people, Seeing how they ran the race which God had set before them, they are now able, as God's people, to run the race God has called them to run. We've talked about this, that in the book of Acts, uh, we see that God has a lot of the times that you and I are to live on this earth, the exact country, the exact places where we are. It's no surprise to God that you're here right now in Winnipeg uh, in the midst of this pandemic. He knew this from before the foundations of the world, and here you are. Not only that, but all of your days are written in his book, every single one of them. And we cannot delay or shorten them. He is faithful to all of these things. And so what we're encouraged here is for these Christians to run the race God has called them to. And as they look to Jesus and see that he also endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So we should long for and experience and walk through the sufferings of Christ as well. And in the rest of Hebrews chapter 12, the Christians are encouraged to not grow weary in their waiting. God sees their patient suffering. He knows what they're walking through, and he's the one that has promised to endure them and keep them and sustain them. And he assures them that they have an unshakable kingdom. So when writing this letter to the Hebrews, who are suffering persecution on account of their faith in Jesus, the writer of Hebrews reminds them of what they have walked through. Some things that they have walked through, the sufferings they had, the thievery of their own property. And he also reminds them of his future promise. And then goes backwards and reminds them of the suffering of all of the saints throughout human history. To be reminded of how the suffering that they are enduring is the same suffering that God's people have always endured. And they are encouraged to trust not what their eyes can see, but rather trust in the promises of God. And then the author gives them this clear call to run the race, to endure, to press on, knowing that God himself has given them this race. He has called them to it, and he assures them of future hope, of future glory. And by rehearsing the faithfulness of God in the past, by reminding themselves, getting into God's word, reminding themselves of how God has provided for his people in the past, it has this, works this strange miracle of reminding them that God will be faithful to them in the future. It's, it's amazing how God's word does that. We read these stories and we're like, oh man, God was faithful here and here and here. And we start looking at what we're all going through and we're like, God's going to be faithful here. And we're able to walk by faith, trusting like them, having this confident trust in God's word. But it is still a miracle that God produces in our hearts. And if you've ever experienced that, don't take that for granted. 
That is a miracle of God, a God-given ability to trust in his promises. It's not by you trying harder to just work that up in you. It's a miracle of God that he works in our hearts as we're in his word. To know that we can trust him, that we can walk by faith, not by sight. But you might be wondering, as we've been kind of walking through all this, what in the world does that have to do with us here and now? Walking through this pandemic, like we're not Hebrew, Hebrew Christians, right? This is not us. We're not walking through state-sponsored suffering like they are. Not yet. Uh, right? No one's taking away your homes yet. Right? Like, like we're not there yet. Now, now, if this ever happens to you, you can go to Hebrews 11 and say, praise God. Right? Like, I know there's a future hope. I know we're looking at the past. But you've got that a lot. But, but for right now, what do we do when we're walking through this right now? Why is Hebrews chapter 11 important for us? Well, we, like the Hebrew Christians in this letter, are walking through a really unsteady time, turbulent time, an uncertain time. Uh, this pandemic has brought all to our minds uh, a, lot of, a lot of things, and I think in and through this, God has a word for us of a call to faith and to endurance, of faith and endurance. For although we have not walked through the kind of suffering that they have walked through, we have walked through suffering. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's physical suffering or pandemics or wars or natural disasters or death or sickness. All of these things have this strange connection between all of them. When, when we're in the midst of them, pandemics, wars, death, whatever, when we're in the midst of them, it's like we're blinded to everything else. Right? If you're ever in loss or in fear or anxiety, it's just like you can't see anything else. It's just blindness in front of you. We can't see beyond them. We're stuck in the moment. We, we don't know the future. Everything that we had known has just disappeared. And if we're not careful, when we walk through uncertain times, we will look for hope in uncertain places. We will put our faith in, in things that, that cannot actually provide for us. We will put our hope in finances or our health or our youth, or in medical experts, or in whatever doctors or social media accounts we're following, or whatever political leader we think is just going to magically bring all this to an end. We, we will run to alcohol, or Netflix, or comfort food, or, or a project. We'll run to anything and everything to get our minds off of the current state of things, which brings us relief for a little while until that thing comes crashing down, and then we are worse off than when we first began. See, the reality of the world that we're living in is that everything is always uncertain. And so where do we go when life seems unstable and insecure and uncertain? When we are so prone to fixating on what we are walking through and wondering if it will ever end, if life will ever get back to normal, we can turn to the book of Hebrews and be reminded of, firstly, God's faithfulness in our salvation— that we are those who, think about it, you once had no confidence standing before God. But now by faith in Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, you have confidence to stand before him. We need to be reminded of that, our position before God. And we need to be reminded of all the things that we have walked through in our lives as Christians with the Lord. How he has grown us, how he has sustained us in our ups and downs. But but even if you're like, well, I don't have a lot of that. I'm very new to Jesus, so what do I do? Well, you have, just like we all still have, we have Hebrews 11. We have God's faithfulness to his people throughout the ages. If you feel like in your life you have never seen the faithfulness of God do something, at least you have Hebrews 11 as well. We all have this. We can see how God has provided and led his people. And we can be reminded of the future hope that we have of the coming kingdom of Jesus. A kingdom that come what may that is coming and in come what may cannot be shaken. And so in these uncertain times, we're gonna be walking through Hebrews 11 and kind of casting our gaze back into the history of God's people and being reminded of God's faithfulness throughout the generations and seeing the lives of these men and women who have run the race that God has set out for them, seeing how they were given the ability by God to trust in his promises, to walk by faith and not by sight, all towards the goal of encouraging us to trust in the promises of God in the midst of these uncertain times. To trust what we've heard over the last few weeks of God's sovereignty, 
that he is the one who works all things together account according to the counsel of his plans and purposes. And that, brothers and sisters, is a bedrock of our hope as we're walking through uncertain times. This past week I went to the bank and I was talking to uh, an account manager uh, in her office and I've met with her before and uh, I was sitting there chatting and she looks at me and said, so how, how are you feeling in the midst of this season? I said, you know, I think if I didn't have faith and confidence that God was just working everything out, I'd be really scatterbrained right now. And she smiled. She's also a Christian. She smiled and said, you know, that's true. We have this confidence that's unshakable. And I said, yes, we do. Right? Like, and that's what it produces in us as God's people. We can walk through uncertain times with no hope that things are getting better in the moment. But we have God's past faithfulness and we have his future promises. Allows us to walk through saying, I was never in control anyway. Right? Like he was always in control. And that is what it's to be to mark us as God's people. This confident trust in God's promises. Not in what we can do, but in who he is. This is God-given ability to trust in the promises of God, come what may. And so in this season, we're going to see how we're being called to walk by faith, not by sight. And then we're going to realize that this is the call on our lives, even when this pandemic is over. Because as we mentioned, we're always living in uncertain times. If tomorrow, all of a sudden, somehow magically, COVID over, like, yay! I will throw our masks away, we'll have a huge bonfire. And, be great. <laughs> and, then, and then guess what? More uncertainty will be coming down the line. See, this is, this is our lives as people here upon the earth. Thing after thing after thing after thing. But in and through it all, we don't... We don't have to get bogged down by the insecurity and the uncertainness of the things that we're walking through because we know he's faithful in the past and he's faithful in the future. And our ultimate hope, our ultimate trust, our ultimate confidence before God is not here. It is found in the person and work of Jesus. And if you, if you don't have that confidence today, we'd love to chat with you and, and pray with you and, and explain a bit more about who God is and how he loves you and how we see that in and through God the Son, Jesus, stepping into time living a perfect life in your place and standing condemned in your place, suffering the Father's wrath and judgment against your sin. And if you are a Christian, my hope is that as we walk through this season, we would continue to be reminded of God's faithfulness and encouraged in that. So let's pray, and then we're going to sing a little bit in response. So God, we're thankful for all that you give us here through the good news of Jesus. We're thankful for your word as well and how you use it in our lives. God, we're thankful that you have given us your word so that we might know who you are that we might know what you require of us, that we might be encouraged by looking at the faithfulness of others in the past. And God, we're thankful that you don't give us places to trust that are insecure and unstable. You give us sure footing. You give us solid places to stand. And it's not in the things of this earth getting better but it is in the finished work of Jesus where our true confidence lies. Oh God, and so I pray that as we're walking through Hebrews chapter 11, that you would, in this call to have faith and to have endurance, that you would produce that in us as your people. Produce in us endurance. We know that on our own, we would not endure. On our own, we would not have faith. These God-given abilities are not ours on our own. We, we need you to give them to us, and so we pray that you would continue to preserve and persevere us by your grace. Pray as well that, that in this season we would constantly be reminded of your faithfulness in the past and the promises of the future. That there is a kingdom that is coming that's unshakable. And may we long for that day more and more. Fill us with hope and trust. We love you, God, and we ask all this in the gracious name of Jesus. Amen.